There's lots of different things that you might see in a potting media. Many of them will promote that they're organic, but most of them are organic (laughs) by nature. They just may or may not have gone through the organic certification process. But it's hard to go wrong with a lot of the potting medias that we have. And they come in different sizes of bags, different price ranges. There's lots to choose from. But in general, you want to look for mixes that are pine bark based if you can, just because it helps us mitigate our soil pH and our water pH challenges. And often they'll have some peat moss mixed in too. And that's that's a nice mix. Whether selecting potting media for small, medium or large containers, flower beds or a raised vegetable garden, the local garden center has a lot of options. If you don't know what you're looking for, though, it can be a confusing experience to read the label. Fortunately, a Kansas State University nursery crop and marketing specialist says there are a few easy steps for screening the available choices down to one that works best for your needs. On today's Sound Living, choosing potting media for outdoor use. Sound Living is a weekly public affairs program produced by Research and Extension at Kansas State University. I'm Jeff Wickman. Kansas State University nursery crop and marketing specialist Cheryl Boyer says that homeowners can make better choices by following three easy steps. Cheryl, you had an opportunity to do a three-part series in the weekly horticulture newsletter that really focused on choosing potting media for outdoor use. And I know that's a question that a lot of people have, and you broke it down really into three separate steps. The first step is just what are you using that potting media for? Yeah. So there's lots of different ways to think about the alternative, those bags of potting material that you see at the garden centers. Some of them are really more for landscape application. Others are for containers. And you really need to think about what size of container you're using and what you're going to put in it. So potting media, there's lots of things that you can use to grow plants in. And it actually matters how big the particle sizes are and what they are composed of. But For a bigger container, you want bigger pieces because they'll break down over time. And for a small container, you want maybe something that has smaller pieces, but definitely has some components of water holding capacity so that, you know, when it gets hot, there's still some resources in that container for the plants because their whole world is inside that pot. If there's if there's not food, if there's not water, if there's not structure, then they they will fail. But there are also some things to know about what not to put in a container, too, that will prevent some challenges. Well, you talked about reading the label, and I often think about, like, food labels, and we look for certain things. I'm assuming that's the same way when we're talking about potting? Yeah, most people actually don't look, and it's kind of an interesting process to look and see what gets put in potting media. It's not as critical as what we eat, of course, but it does influence how your plants will perform in containers. For example, probably the worst thing that you could put in a container is field soil. And there are quite a few materials that are just bagged field soil. And in a container, there's just not enough airspace and it will tighten up like concrete and make it so plants really can't explore and get resources and nutrients that they need. And they'll really struggle in that kind of situation. A lot of the other materials are sphagnum peat moss, which is generally mined in Canada for here. And there's different species, there's different sizes, there's different coarsenesses of it, or aged or broken down. Pine bark is a big one. There's also a difference between pine bark, which has a low pH, which as you know, our soils in Kansas tend to be high in soil pH, which some plants struggle with. So if you can put those low pH items in the potting media, our water, which might actually be kind of alkaline or high in pH, will begin to balance that out a little bit and provide a a neutral environment for plants. Hardwood bark, on the other hand, is a little bit different and tends to be higher in pH. And a lot of materials have that. It doesn't break down quite as quickly as some of the other materials. There's lots of different things that you might see in a potting media. Many of them will promote that they're organic, but most of them are organic (laughs) by nature. They just may or may not have gone through the organic certification process. But it's hard to go wrong with a lot of the potting medias that we have. And they come in different sizes of bags, different price ranges. There's lots to choose from. But in general, you want to look for mixes that are pine bark based if you can, just because it helps us mitigate our soil pH and our water pH challenges. And often they'll have some peat moss mixed in too. And that's that's a nice mix. Before I forget, I want to add, there are some 
things that you want to look for in terms of food for plants. So in horticulture and greenhouse, a lot of times when we talk about potting media that we're using to grow in a commercial setting, we talk about it having a starter charge. So a starter charge means that when they prepared that mix before they bagged it up, they put it in a mixer and they added some fertilizer. In some cases, you would prefer it not to have anything in it. But if it's going to go in a container for your annual plants, it's really nice to go ahead and have some fertilizer already mixed in so that plants have something to eat (laughs) as soon as you get them in the container. Well, that's kind of a consideration, too, then, if you are using potting soil that you maybe got last year that you had left over, you may need to maybe jumpstart that a little bit. Yeah. So there's some things to think about when you have leftover potting media. And I had some of that this year. For one, it gets really dried out. So you may have to put it in a wheelbarrow and run the hose in it and mix it up and get it to re-wet a little bit. Over the winter, it probably won't lose its fertilizer. It's probably in there somewhere. You might have some fungal growth in there. If you have that, I think it would probably be better to toss it on your lawn as organic material Just because when you get those fungal items in there, they tend to repel moisture and prevent it from being a resource for water and nutrients. So sometimes that happens. You just toss it out. I also get a lot of questions about, can I reuse potting media? And my general recommendation is to just pull it out of your containers and throw it on your lawn for organic material and start fresh each year. That's because, A, the fertilizer is probably gone. B, it might be hydrophobic. So repelling water. And the other part is that while you're using it, we have insects that come along and you might have insect eggs. You might have disease holdovers from something that happened the year before that are not going to cause problems on your lawn, but they might cause problems for fresh plants that you put in in the spring. So I just recommend pulling it all out and tossing it on the lawn. You can sterilize it. There are ways to do it, but it's just easier to start fresh, I think. Well, some of these I recognize, the perlite, the vermiculite, those are things that I've kind of heard of. And then you get to some of the other things where you're kind of, you might look at the label and go, "Eh, what is this? Is this something I really need or don't need? Right. That's true. And sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. Depends on their quantity. So in that way, it is much like a label. Like the highest quantity item will be listed first in the percentage. When we're talking about vermiculite and perlite, those are inorganic materials that are generally there for airspace or particle size, vermiculite's often used pretty heavily in plant propagation where you need a light media that the roots can grow easily into, and then you would shift it up to a larger container that has more structure to it. The perlite are those little white expanded materials. A lot of people think that's fertilizer, and it's not fertilizer at all. It is really just for airspace. And one of the things that we discovered in our research at K-State is that you could mix up, we were chipping up full wood products to see how that would work in a media, not just bark, but the wood product. The little wood pieces in in certain sizes really could be a substitute for perlite. So the wood-based substrates are becoming more mainstream, so you may see more of those available for sale. And they do fine. They do great. They've been engineered to work in the situations that we put them in as well. But they're nice replacements for perlite, I think. And you'll still see both. There's lots of common materials that continue to be used. And we also are innovating in what's available for plants to grow in. You talked about it in terms of mixing and managing and lime fertilizer and a wetting agent, all things that we need to keep in mind. Yeah. So we tend to have a lot of lime, but there are some potting medias that if they have been shipped from areas of the country that already have low pH, so the southeastern United States, their soils And their potting medias often are in the four range. And we're shooting for five, six. But by nature in Kansas, we're often looking at seven and eights on the pH scale. So that's a unique regional thing. So if your potting media was constructed in Georgia, they might have added a lot of lime because in Georgia, it's important to help raise the soil pH, whereas in Kansas, we are trying to lower or neutralize the pH. So we would actually want to look for something that either doesn't have lime at all or has gypsum in it that can help mitigate our soil properties as well. But, you know, in the end, we can make just about anything work. But when I'm purchasing, I I try to avoid products that have lime in them if I can. Might be a silly question, but does it matter what 
you're planting what you're trying to grow. Does that come into play at all when we're talking about what kind of potting media to use? You know, in Kansas, there are some low pH loving plants that we can't grow particularly well in our soils. And sometimes you might want to grow that woody plant in a container. And in that case, you might be looking for a different mix that is more suited to that plant that's definitely very acidic and on the low pH scale. I'm thinking of azaleas and rhododendrons. We can grow these in the landscape here, but they might do better in a container. You'll need to overwinter it in a protected spot, but that is a unique space. But for the most part, I think most of us are using our containers for annuals. And as long as we've got something that's relatively neutral, we'll be in pretty good shape. But there have been some innovations in what we're looking at for containers. On the production side of things, there's a a whole other world of considerations that you would look at for different crops, mostly looking at how plants use water. So if you have a plant that prefers to be dry, like a succulent, you might want a coarser material that you don't water very often at all because the plants don't grow that way. In nursery crop production, we would group plants by how much water they need on a regular basis, and we might be able to mitigate some of those irrigation challenges with the potting media that we use. But this new work that they've been exploring is called stratified substrates. So that's where they're taking these substrates that have different properties and layering them in a container. And part of that is if you think about how a plant is going to grow, you put that little tiny plant in your container and it's really only using the food and the water that's available in the first few inches. And as that plant grows, it might not need access to that much food or access to that much density. So it might benefit from having a layer of coarseness. So this is relevant if you have a really big pot, you might be able to put mulch in the bottom and then layer on your more expensive materials and still have a really good experience with a container. And it's not as heavy. A lot of this work has been done at Louisiana State University and at the USDA in Ohio. And so it's just really cool to see what they're trying and how they're innovating and and really rethinking how we approach a container. But it's still brand new thinking. And I think probably the biggest application would be really large containers that would benefit from some coarseness at the bottom, not broken shards, but some organic mulch. And that would help them not be as heavy as well. And there are a lot of resources through extension, a lot of information really from just your local nursery as well. Yeah. So it's always wonderful to talk to your independent garden center. They have tons of information, lots of specialized training to help people think through what their needs are. And they can just lickety split, help you find exactly the type of plant that meets your needs. And everybody has different specific needs and goals for their lawn and landscape and their container plants. And every part of your yard is a little bit different. So I think that's one of the fun things about gardening and being someone who loves plants is that you get to try new things every year. And over time, your yard will change. It might get shadier or you might lose a tree and move to full sun and you get to try something new. And that's when you can go use those resources. You can use your folks at the local independent garden center and they'll put out some educational resources probably on their social media as well. But please don't forget to contact your local extension horticulture agent. They have tons of resources. And I love to think about horticulture agents like information nodes. I mean, all of us as extension professionals, if we don't know the answer because we've had the question before and looked it up, we know pretty quickly which direction to look to find the right answer. So please get familiar with your local extension agent. You can find a map on the KSRE website for statewide locations. We have a presence in all 105 counties, and we have about 30-ish agents who have some sort of specialization in horticulture that can help answer questions all over the state. And they help each other. They network. If they don't know the answer, if they get something that stumps them, they ask the rest of the team. And so we're able to share and resource all across the state to help answer your questions. Wherever they are, whatever they might be, we will help you find an answer. That's Kansas State University Nursery Crop and Marketing Specialist Cheryl Boyer with information on choosing potting media for outdoor use. The articles in the weekly horticulture newsletter can be found in the May 23rd, May 30th, and June 6th editions. Sound Living is a weekly public affairs program produced by Research and Extension at Kansas State University. I'm Jeff Wickman.
And this is the K-State Radio Network.